I'm very happy to be able to introduce Chris Watson. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, that was so relevant, Arlene was talking about. Um, <clears throat> and during this, my, my piece about sounds in the natural world, I'd like you to remember that not only are children and adults and all of us affected by no noise pollution, but also every other animal that we share the planet with um, is affected, sometimes in more serious ways. Um, I'm a sound recordist and I specialize in the sounds of wildlife and natural history. And I work with those on television and in radio, feature films. I make CDs for an independent label. I work on sound design of, of games. And I, I'm also interested in creating installations. I make compositions out of my work and install them in museums and galleries around the world. So I'm not a scientist. I'm not an academic. But I do have an opinion and a view based on 30 years of recording sounds in the natural world. So what I'd like to do is just play some examples of my work um, and, and talk about those and discuss the implications of it. What I'd like to do, could we lose some of the lights on the stage because there's really nothing to see up here. Um, and it's a, thanks, it's a much better environment for listening at lower light levels, I found, particularly in sort of social environments. So I'm a sound recorder, and I spend a lot of my time recording wildlife. So of course, I record lots of things like this. This is a dawn chorus recorded just to the north of Bergen um, in May. Lots of contributions from dozens, maybe hundreds of songbirds. all sorts of songs and signals. And I spend a lot of my time recording these wide angle ambient sounds of the natural world. I also record single point sources of sound in close up. Like that, which wasn't recorded in Norway. <laughs> that was a lioness rejecting the advances of a male lion in the Maasai Mara in Kenya. Now, we know and love and enjoy birdsong, and we have an opinion, of course, we don't really know what, what, it, what message it conveys, all those myriad voices of birdsong. Judging by your reaction, I think all of us knows exactly what that lioness was saying to that male lion. Single point source of sound. They're the two extremes within which I work. And the interesting thing about them is perspective, um, which Jonas touched on this morning. I, I, um, I had translated in, in, school, in school rooms. And by perspective, I mean the relative distance between the source of the sound, which is my mouth at the moment and nose, and this microphone. This is very, very close perspective sound. We don't hear the world like that. We normally hear the world through all sorts of reflections and reverberations, which has been discussed this morning. And part of my work is to capture um, those reflections and, and reverberations, the acoustic of the environment. And also interesting for me increasingly is the spatial element, where, um, which is why Anders has gone to the trouble, gone to the trouble in installing a four-channel sound system here, because it's... It's, it's not the way we hear the world, but it's rather closer than simply two-dimensional stereo, as which my daughter would say is very 20th century. I'm much more interested in engaging in spatial sound. But also the content, and you know, going from the Maasai Mara to the square outside my hotel and the square outside this hall, I heard birds on my way in this morning, despite the weather, um, blue tits and great tits, and one bird in particular, this one. In English, it's a wren. The scientific name is Troglodytes troglodytes. You may know the, the song. <whistles> uh, 
that's a burst of rent song. And to us, we describe that as, you know, maybe describe it as musical, but having lots of trills and incredible density of information. There's a current body of thinking which I'm really interested in that I've explored a little bit with some of my friends at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. This sense of temporal resolution. And by that, I mean the speed at which information is resolved. And there's a sort of novel idea, at least, that although we can hear and appreciate and enjoy birdsong and all these rapid sounds that we hear, we don't hear it in the same way as birds because they're literally living in a different time frame for us. Their temporal resolution has far greater detail. I can demonstrate this in a fairly basic way by slowing down that wren song. That burst of song you just heard was eight seconds. Within those eight seconds, there were 64 individual notes. And what that bird's doing, just out here, is what we believe or understand it's doing, is transmitting information about its status, its place within the territory, its, its sexual status, its breeding status. So it's trying to attract females, but at the same time, give a different signal to rival males to back off. So there's a lot of complex information in that burst of 64 notes in eight seconds. And one way that we can start to resolve it so that it perhaps doesn't make more sense to us, but we can appreciate the content, is an old technique all I've done is slow that Wren song down to a 16 second song where we start to be able to resolve the individual notes There's still an incredible amount of information, including that, that trill at the end, where we can, I, I certainly I can't still resolve the individual notes. So here it is again, slowed down twice, which reduces the pitch by two octaves and extends the time of playback again. But again, finally, we're in a, a place, a position to measure and count and at least hear the individual notes in that song. So next time you're on the street or in your back garden and you hear a wren song, just remember the amount of information that tiny bird is packing into its, uh, its song. <whistles> Temporal resolution is, is about frequency, basically about frequency and time, but also like some pieces of music, apart from the dynamics. What's also important are the spaces between, because of these birds, like all of us, like all other animals, um, are not only singing, but they're listening intently. Uh, their lives depend on it, their breeding success depends on it. So listening is a crucial bit of behavior for them. So the gaps in between um, are times when most of them are actually listening to hear if their message is getting across or to hear a reply. And those gaps or pulses are relevant in whole groups of animals, but I guess the most common one would be amphibians, frogs. Um, and this is a chorus of frogs, again recorded in East Africa around a marshland. But what's interesting about frogs is not only do they call and respond and listen, but because they are collections of species living in sharing the same habitat, they've evolved effectively different languages which separate them out in frequency. So this is a, a chorus of frogs around an African marsh with quite dramatic differences in frequency so that the species don't overlap or mask each other. The very high-pitched Tinkling sounds are also frogs.
And collections of the same species, um, communities of animals, and again, um, amphi or lizards in, in this case, have evolved almost this coding system where they call and respond and listen to their neighbors. This next track is a recording of barking geckos recorded in South Africa. Barking geckos are about 10 centimeters long, and the males sit on the inside of their burrows because they're very um, likely to be predated by uh, frogs or small, uh, by um, small mammals or birds of prey. But they, they excavate their burrow to form effectively an acoustic trumpet. So these tiny amphibians sit just on the inside of the lip of their burrow and call, make this tock tock call, but it's acoustically amplified by the mouth of their burrow. And these animals sit there at dusk, again, to attract a, a female, but to also contact other animals in their community and give warnings about maybe passing birds of prey or, um, or mammals um, seeking out these, these lizards. And so they call and respond with this really interesting sort of coded system. These are all just one species in one community. These are barking geckos. So the dynamics, the volume of the call is important um, with these animals. Up to now, everything we've heard of has been vocalizations, either produced by birds, syrinxes, or the apparatus, the vocal apparatus in those geckos, or with frogs. But of course, sound exists, uh, communication, animals communicate in other means rather th other than vocalizing, and probably the best group for that are invertebrates, insects, which don't vocalize, but they mechanically produce sound, they stridulate. So they vibrate or rub the body parts together, which produces an audible sound. Although to the insects, what's important is the vibration, quite often picked up through the substrate. But to us, it's, it's audible as, um, as changing air pressure, as sound as we normally hear it. But the, the apparatus that produces it is mechanical, rather like a, um, a violin or cello being bowed. So it's a vibration, and the vibration usually passes through the substrate, um, the vegetation that the animals are on, or are picked and picked up many insects, grasshoppers and crickets. Effectively, their ears are part of their leg mechanism, so they detect the vibrations. This is a, one of the largest, um, or the largest cricket in, in the United Kingdom, and probably this part of Europe as well. This is a great green bush cricket, Singing, you know, we give it, a, we allude to it musically. It's male singing to attract a female. We can hear that with our relatively narrow frequency range, let's say, for sake of argument, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. But much of that sound is ultrasonic. It's in a frequency range above our hearing, above 20 kilohertz. And when those animals, the a chorus of insects, coalesce, we get these really beautiful harmonic structures, which probably don't mean much to the insects, but rather like a dawn chorus, you get this incredible aggregation of frequencies, which, because it's mechanical stridulation, is very rich harmonically, um, rather like the bows of a, the, the strings of a, a violin or a viola being bowed. It produces many harmonics. So in areas of great density of insects, the Congo and the, the tropics, for example, you get these really stunning choruses of insects, which to my ears anyway, has this really sort of beautiful musical character. 
Um, this is a chorus of insects in the Congo in that sort of golden hour at sunset when the, the light goes and the temperature drops. So these insects can't hear each other, but they can certainly feel the vibrations um, passing through the rainforest. But to our ears, this is how it sounds. It's quite loud as well. So there's tens, thousands, probably tens of thousands of individual invertebrates contributing to this chorus. That's within our audio spectrum. But something else is happening as well, as I said earlier. They are also um, transmitting very high frequency sound, ultrasonic signals beyond our, our hearing range. But there are ways in which we can tune into that range. Um, this, um, is it, could we have a little bit of light, please, on the bat detector, not on me? This is a device that picks up ultrasonic signals and draws them down uh, into our frequency range. Um, actually, what's really interesting here, if I tune this, you'll hear that. That's quite shocking, actually. We were, um, Arlene was talking about, and other people were talking this morning about classroom acoustics. I didn't expect to hear this, but this auditorium was surrounded by ultrasonic signals because this thing's... That's only 22 kilohertz. That's just, just above our upper frequency of most young people's hearing. Up to 30 kilohertz. So there's a whole harmonic structure. <clears throat> this is off topic, but because I can hear this, I'll mention it. One of my concerns is that, certainly in classrooms with younger children who can hear very high frequencies before they're dulled by sort of age and over listening to MP3s with little earphones plugged into their ears, um, there are lots of signals around which they're probably much more sensitive to than us. But in a place like this, there is no you know, reason uh, to experience ultrasonic signals like that. Part of my idea is that, and I say I'm not a scientist, I'm not academic, but this idea of sick building syndrome, I'm convinced the acoustics of environments affect us. So if you're sat under that all day, you might not be able to hear it, but I'm convinced that has an effect on us. And it can't be a very good one. Has anybody got any keys in the pocket? Metal keys. Just get them out and shake them. So metal on contact with it itself produce a significant ultrasound. Those of you who've got a dog at home, and um, some people say to me, oh, my dog's psychic, because whenever I pick the lead up by the front door, it knows it's going for a walk and comes running to the front door. I mean, it might be psychic, or more likely, it might be, it might be picking up the ultrasonic signals of its lead being rattled. As I said, this is a bat detector, and so, you know, guess what I record with it? Um, Bats use ultrasound um, as echolocation to see effectively with sound. So they put out very high frequency signals depending on the species and listen, listen to what's coming back. And we believe, of course we don't know, that through that they create a three-dimensional map of their surroundings. They also use it to home in onto insects. And bats exist, insectivorous bats at least, um, live in a world completely outside of our hearing range. And this is, I've got a, a track to demonstrate this. I was out recording in a woodland in, in Wales, the west of England, a few years ago, and I was recording by a stream. 
And I noticed just at sunset that above the stream, there was a great gathering of insects. And so there was also a great gathering of bats, pipistrelle bats, one of the commonest species of bat, occurs all over Sweden as well as um, the UK. And pipistrelle bats use echolocation signals around about 45 kilohertz to track these insects in flight. So I was stood in this, you know, sort of beautiful woodland clearing at sunset, a warm summer's evening, sort of soporific, very relaxing place that to my ears, or our ears, sounded like this. But to the bats above my head, when I turned my ordinary microphone off and turned the bat detector on, this place wasn't some beautiful, warm, relaxing, tranquil environment. It was carnage because the bats were ho catching and hoovering up hundreds and thousands of insects over my head and existing in a completely different sonic environment that sounded like this. It sounds like a battlefield. and then back to how it sounds for us. Actually, the sound of water is a good link. Could we change the color, please? Um, the environment that has interested me a lot in the past five or six years is not airborne sounds, but sounds in water, and in particular, sounds in our seas and oceans. Um, I'm, you know, we all arrogantly sometimes think that we live on planet Earth, and of course we don't, we live on planet ocean. 70% of our planet is occupied by the seas and the oceans, and we live on the relatively small dry bits in between. And sound behaves differently and much more efficiently in salt water. Sound in seawater travels almost five times faster than through air, and it's a great environment for sound and vibrations in particular. Most animals that live in the oceans, uh, rather like the insects I was talking about earlier, detect sound through vibration um, in a rather different way. But it's possible to record that environment by using hydrophones, which are underwater microphones. When I was a teenager, I'm 62 now, but when I was a teenager in the late 60s, um, I grew up watching on television in, in the UK. Um, programs are made by Jacques Cousteau, the famous sort of marine explorer and biologist, who famously in the 1950s wrote a book called The Silent World. And then there was a film made about it. And I bought into that. I used to watch these scientists jumping off Calypso and exploring underwater in the Mediterranean and around the world. And that's what I imagined it was until I got my first hydrophone and realized that's complete nonsense. Um, the oceans are the most sound-rich environment we have on the planet. So not only are the largest, they're completely full of sound. I worked on a radio program for the BBC um, with Dr. Chris Clark from Cornell University, a brilliant marine biologist who tells me they have yet to discover a deaf sea animal. Everything in the ocean lives in a world of, of sound and vibrations. Starting with the rest of this presentation, I'll play sounds that are recorded with hydrophones, so nothing in the air. All these remaining sounds are recorded in water. And starting off on the very edge, so surrounding your coast here, um, around the Baltic coast, are full of rock pools. There's, there's some sandy beaches, but rock pools. And again, rock pools look like these areas of inner space, these sites still silent worlds, but drop a hydrophone into that and you realize it's a tiny but very sound-rich 
environment. This is the sound of a rock pool not just on the coast near my home in Northumberland. That particularly loud cracking and snapping is a, a species of animal that's part of a large family. These are pistol shrimps. Pistol shrimps are uh, maybe a centimeter long, sometimes smaller, sometimes much larger. But they have asymmetric claws. So they have an ordinary sized claw and a very large claw. And they hang out in rock pools and on rock ledges um, with this large claw hanging open. And when a passing prey, a tasty morsel, swims past a pistol shrimp, they will snap this giant claw shut with great speed and great power, so much so that it creates a vacuum underwater, creates cavitation. And as the water collapses back into the vacuum, it creates this, this bang, this snap, which is loud enough to stun or kill passing prey. So in these tiny rock pools, there's this animal that's evolved to use sound as a weapon um, to get its food. They also signal with it as well. It's one of the, per body size, I think it's the, uh, the, probably the loudest sound of, of any animal. Um, I'll just go, sort of go through the food chain. It's probably the simplest description of it. I discovered a few years ago, I was working in, in Norway out of Bergen at the Institute of Marine Research. Um, and they have a whole series of marine reserves in, in fjords on the west coast to study the breeding behavior of fish, um, cod and haddock in particular, but also herring. Um, and they discovered, I don't know if they discovered, but they'd done a lot of work in listening to the sounds that these fish made, which was completely new territory, territory to me. Fish like cod and haddock have very beautiful and eloquent voices, which was a real surprise. They, fish have a, what's called a swim bladder inside the body, which is filled with gas and liquid. And around the swim bladder are some very powerful muscles called drum muscles. And they can vibrate these drum muscles with great rapidity effectively to create something like um, compressing the, the muscles around the swim bladder to, to create this sound, but they use it to communicate and other fish pick up the vibrations um, along their lateral line. So in February time, in this um, reserve, Lindespol, north of Bergen, the haddock come in to spawn and the haddock sing, the males sing to the females prior to fertilization with songs and sounds such as this. These are haddock. Also, cod, larger cod, as they grow older um, and become larger, the frequency of their song, the males, these are the, the loud sort of gulping songs of the males, and then they swim in parallel with the females, release the milts, the females release the eggs, and fertilization takes place as the, these fish actually duet um, during that process. But these are the, the songs, the calls of, um, of cod. The whole point, I think, this, from my point of view, is what we talked about earlier, is we are filling the seas with noise pollution. We don't know how much damage we're doing to all the animals that live in the oceans. 
the Norwegians are obviously concerned about the conservation of fish stocks, particularly what the Russians are doing in the Barents Sea with exploration for oil and great um, noises produced by um, the geological process and the seismic activity. So it, it's an unheard pollution because we simply really don't know what damage we're doing. Apart from the fact I was just astonished that these quite simple, as we would regard them, sentient almost animals have developed this remarkable vocabulary, uh, much of which is unknown to us. This next recording is um, just an example, I just wanted to include it. It's, it's the most beautiful sound of any animal I've ever heard, recorded in a very hostile environment. This is a recording I made. I worked on a BBC series called Frozen Planet with David Attenborough, and we actually went to the North Pole, but we were based in Svalbard in April when there was a lot of sea ice, and uh, we were filming bearded seals on the surface, but I put my hydrophones through two breathing holes in the sea ice um, a few kilometers offshore to record the songs of bearded seals. Um, the males, because it's very dark, a very hostile environment, the males hang vertically. These are sort of three meter long, 900 pound seals. The males hang vertically, head down, and sing to coordinate their harem of females. But because of the way sound travels through seawater, and because of the fact there's no wave action, because the surface of the sea is, th is frozen to about three meters, and I was recording in about 800 meters depth in the Arctic Ocean. The songs of these bearded seals radiate for tens of kilometers under the sea ice. Uh, Professor Christian Lederson at the Norwegian Polar Institute identified these, these songs and explained the process to me. So some of the sounds on this recording are from animals that could, could be 30 kilometers away from my hydrophones. But these are the males singing collectively to contact each other, but also importantly, to retain their own individual harem of females. If anything sounds like the sounds of another planet, this is it. That's very necessary behavior if you're a male bearded seal, but it does have potential consequences because as the sea ice starts to break up, the world's top carnivorous predator enters those waters, and these are orca killer whales, and they enter those territories in their hundreds. Uh, orca live in pods in these large sort of family, uh, large family groups as we understand it. And these are highly intelligent animals. Their brains are several times larger than ours. I don't usually anthropomorphize, but I have the greatest respect for orcas. Um, six or seven meters long, five tons of carnivorous predator. Um, they're air-breathing mammals, just the same as we are. We evolved in the oceans, and at some point, basically, we came out of the oceans um, to live and breathe on dry land. Orcas did exactly the same. They evolved in the oceans, came out of the ocean, but at some point made the decision to go back into the seas. And as I said, they live in these large extended groups. They communicate, they vocalize between each other. The females teach, uh, will teach her calf a particular strophe, a pattern of sounds which Vincent Yannick at Aberdeen University identified as a signature whistle. They also um, hunt with echolocation 
in a very similar way to bats. So they have these highly evolved um, extended family groups. Um, I sometimes think, you know, who's the smartest? We, um, we stay up here with paying VAT and having mortgages um, and sort of crammed together, as we eloquently described earlier, in, in, for in apartments in Sweden, whereas orcas have free range of 70% of the planet and nothing will mess with a pod of orcas. So I do wonder sometimes who's, who's the smartest. But they have these incredible um, communications and vocal patterns as they're traveling together under the sea ice. So this is, this is a four-channel recording of a group of 30 or 40 orcas echolocating, but vocalizing, communicating with each other in the darkness under the sea ice. When I was recording those animals, it was on Svalbard, and I have to say, a Swedish icebreaker, Kolly Oden, was coming up there to cut a way into Long Yerbin or to clear a passage for, for some other ships. And I had to stop recording when the icebreaker was over 20 kilometers away from my hydrophones, because the noise threshold had gone to the sort of pain threshold underwater into their world, a world uh, of these animals that rely and live with sound. I've got one more recording to play. It's not mine, but I get permission from the British Library National Sound Archive to play this recording. It's the one animal I've been trying to record in Iceland, um, and I failed to do so in the last five years. This is a recording made by the British Antarctic Survey in the 1960s. It's a very old recording, and it's a recording of the largest and loudest animal which has ever lived, which is the blue whale. 30 meters long, 100 tons, uh, an animal which sings, again, we allude to it musically, um, infrasonically, so below our frequency of hearing. So this last track is one song phrase from a blue whale, but then two versions, rather like the wren, but in an opposite way, speeding up the sound, so it draws it up into our frequency range, but also reduces the duration by about half. Um, this is a song phrase of the blue whale. This is an animal that could communicate across thousands of kilometers before we fill the seas with noise pollution. That's one song phrase. The, the next two reduce the duration by half, but raise the pitch by an octave. Might start to affect the fabric of the building a bit. One more brief phrase. This is two octaves higher. It's 
Tack för att ni lyssnar. We have some time for questions. Just one thing I, I wondered, the technological, uh, the devel development with new tech things, new microphones must allow you to hear more things today than, than, than we use, to record more things today than we should, could, could uh, in the 40s and 50s, I yeah. guess. We well, can do. The, 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 um the problem, the paradox to that is the world's a much noisier place. Yeah. So we can hear a lot more and we can hear a lot of the noise we're producing. The technology is vastly improved. Yeah. But so, as everybody's been saying today, so is the noise. Yeah. So I was thinking of how much of, of, of the sound in the world haven't we heard yet when it comes to wildlife and, and nature? Well, most of it, because yeah. most of it is in the oceans. Yeah. So we're still, you know, I mean, the, you know, again, it's a paradox. We know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the ocean floor yeah. in many places. And it's, a, it's full of sound. So, yeah, there's lots to explore, which always encourages me. Has, has this life of, of recording these sounds changed the, the way you, you look at the world? Uh? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think as we, somebody alluded to earlier, we don't have ear lids. So we, we can't sleep. And we're all good listeners because we've evolved from people who 40,000 years ago, when we were all in caves, we are descended from the people that woke up when hyenas and saber-toothed tigers came into the cave. The people who didn't wake up aren't here today for obvious reasons. Um, so we're all very good listeners. And you know, that's one of the, the great problems in our society is that we're just bombarded by more and more noise. I mean, I contend that we hear everything, but we rarely get the opportunity of listening. You're lucky in Sweden, you've got places that are still left. It's a relatively small population in a large country. There are places I've been in the north of Sweden. Um, I think Jonas was talking about this last night, where you can still go and open your ears and engage with the world in really a unique way. This is not some artistic whim. It's necessary for our psychological health and well-being. There's lots of people have been talking about this morning. You know, we need that quietness um, for our survival, I think. Mm. Any questions from, from the audience? Thank you for a very interesting lecture. Thank you. Uh, just a matter of, of curiosity, really. Um, the seal, I mean, the, the, the prey to the orca you were talking about before, do we know how they hear the signal system uh, going around? Because uh, they must be able to hear and read what the predators are trying to do, aren't they? Yes, I'm sure they do, but they, it must be very difficult to avoid orcas who hunt cooperatively. Um, I mean, I've, ex I've seen, I've experienced that for myself in the Antarctic. I've seen them hunting Weddell seals where they have strategies. They'll pick one seal out um, and, um, and hunt them. And again, Vincent Yanni, if we've got time, there's a fascinating um, supposition that he talked to me about is that they use their echolocation um, also to communicate. So if I'm talking to Anders, I can see there's a laptop computer behind Anders that he can't see at the moment because he's looking for me. So when orcas are hunting cooperatively, what Vincent has suggested is that with the echolocation, which is a picture of sound effectively, I can scan over Anders' shoulder and see that Macintosh computer. And I can then repeat that signal to Anders so it's, it's rather like the very inefficient way if I'm saying, oh, by the way, Anders, there's a computer behind you. But what Anders sees is what I've just seen. He sees with, through echolocation an image, we, we, perhaps, of what I've just seen, which sort of explains telepathy to a point. So I can scan something and then repeat that scan 
and others will pick that up, which is astonishing if that's the case, and, and explains why the very, these highly intelligent animals can form a, a strategy for hunting uh, seals. Even when they're on sea ice, they'll swim underneath the sea ice and create a bow wave, bow wave, which breaks up the sea ice. The seal falls into the sea, which they then can take very easily. But again, I don't, we just don't know, you know a lot of this. There's so much interesting work to be done. Chris, is there any way to, to follow your work if, if you, we want to see what, what you're doing and what you have done and listen to, yeah, to, you to your recordings? You could buy my records. You could buy <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you can go, I've got a website, chriswatson.net, yeah. and there's a newsletter attached to that. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming. It's a and pleasure. This wonderful thank you. For us. Thank Chris you. Watson. Ja, naturens ljud gör ju någonting med oss. Vi kan väl känna det här i slutet när, när, när lite läskiga djuret kom. Oh. Sådär. Vi reagerar instinktivt.